Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art and Conversation. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to give a visual description. Um, and this visual description is something that we're doing for every Art and Conversation. It's to help with um, giving our blind and low vision audience members a better sense of who we are as speakers and presenters here. My name is Jaleesa Johnston. I am a black woman. I wear black, black rimmed glasses. I have my hair up in a bun. Um, it's, I have black curly hair. I'm wearing hoop earrings. Um, I have a lip and uh, a lip piercing and two nose piercings. Um, I'm wearing this really awesome um, silk screened uh, shirt of a drawing of a woman by my friend and artist, Paula. Um, I have on a purple sweater and I'm sitting in a blue room um, and behind me are two bookcases with a bunch of books and a lamp and um, you can see the beginnings of my door frame off to the side. Um, so thank you. Welcome for come. Or th oh, sorry, this morning is all kinds of mixed up, including my words. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, again, my name is Jalisa and I work in the Learning and Community Partnerships Department. Um, and I'm very excited to be doing this month's Art and Conversation. Um, I like to start off every program by giving um, a, an opening about what the program was and what it is. Um, it has quite a history. Art and Conversation has been one of our most popular regular programs. Um, it's been running for a very long time. Um, it's on the third Tuesday of every month. And it used to be when we were before quarantine, um, it used to be two hours. It would begin in the morning around 9.15 with the first hour dedicated to coffee and donuts and socializing. Um, and for that reason, I think it was quite popular for the community that it was able to foster. Um, and then the second hour from about 10.15 to 11, we would have um, a guest speaker. And we've had a range of guest speakers in the past from curators um, to different staff members, to artists in the community, to other arts organizations in the Portland community. Um, and then following the program, which it is a free program, it always has been, um, everyone who's attended gets to go into the museum for free and see what's on view. Of course, during quarantine, it looks different. It's a little different. Um, we are still offering the lecture portion of Art and Conversation um, still on the third Tuesday of every month at 10 a.m. Um, and we are still featuring a range of speakers. I think one of the silver linings of uh, this very difficult year of COVID and quarantining is that because it's virtual, we're able to offer it to a larger audience, um, audience members that who wouldn't normally be able to come to the museum. Um, and then as a result, we're also able to invite um, a larger array of guests to speak. So it's kind of an exciting moment as much as it is um, very stressful. Um, but, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing this as an opportunity to continue the conversation around art, to continue to connect larger communities um, via the internet. So that is the history of this program. And uh, I also wanted to mention just some housekeeping before we move on. Um, we had some issues trying to go live on Facebook. So if you know of anybody that was trying to access it via Facebook, we're not able to do that today. Um, please share this link with them or direct them to the um, link to come into the Zoom and they can join us here. Um, and then also, if you have questions, which I'm sure you will have many questions after today's awesome, awesome program, please enter your questions into the Q&A, not into the chat box, but into the Q&A box. And then we'll have time to go through them at the end of the um, talk. And so with that, um, I would like to take this moment to welcome our speaker for today, Grace Cook Anderson. I'm gonna read a little bio. Um, so Grace Cook Anderson is the Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Curator of Northwest Art. Grace Cook Anderson was appointed as the Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Curator of Northwest Art in January of 2017. Prior to joining the museum, she was an adjunct assistant professor of art in the School of Art and Design at Portland State University and worked as an independent curator and arts writer. 
From 2008 to 2015, Cook Anderson was the curator of contemporary art at Laguna Art Museum. And today, Grace is joining us to talk about Art and Race Matters, the work of Robert Colescott. And the floor is yours, Grace. Thank you for being here this morning. Thanks, Julissa. Thanks for having me. And I'm so glad um, the Art and Conversation is up and live on this platform, though I miss seeing you all in person. I do, um, I do love the audience members of for Art and Conversation. It's so great. Um, so I'll provide a visual description um, for myself and my setting. Um, I'm an Asian woman with black hair. Uh, my hair is tied back in a bun. Um, I've got pearl earrings and I'm wearing a gray um, mock turtleneck sweater. Um, I'm sitting at a floor desk, which kind of gives you a wider view of my um, room that I'm in. I have two bookshelves and a door in the background, a sofa and a lamp that you can see. Um, also in that back corner, there is a rowing machine that's leaning against the wall that I've abandoned for the last month, but I promise to use it again starting next week. Um, it's a nagging presence and I need to get back on it. <laughs> um, so I, um, you know, the exhibition opened on February 15th and then um, just under a month we closed. Um, we had to close with um, the pandemic and sheltering in place. And so I don't know if many of you had a chance to see the exhibition. And um, I, there are over 70 works in the exhibition. So um, I'm not able to um, really do an in-depth overview of the exhibition, but I will um, provide as much as I can here. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and then, okay, how does that look? It looks good. Okay. Um, and I wonder, okay. So, um, so Art and Race Matters, the career of Robert Colescott is the first comprehensive retrospective of Robert Colescott, um, organized by the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati and curated by Lowry Stokes Sims and Matthew Wesley. Um, as the coordinating curator here in Portland, it was such a great privilege to work with them and they've been such generous scholars. Um, as I had mentioned with over 70 works of art um, in the exhibition, each so densely rich with imagery, I had a lot of difficulty editing the exhibition down for our time this morning. Um, I was even counting, I think last night I even had to cut out 10 more slides. Um, but in addition to briefly walking you through Colescott's career, I also wanted to spend a little bit of time um, around the works that have been staying with me um, recently. And it changes certainly with time. Um, I, my favorites um, have been changing um, since the opening of this exhibition. Cole Scott's work is so engaged with our very issues right now of racial justice reckoning around gender and identity, and none of this is easy territory. Um, but this is in some ways, I think, Cole Scott's gift to us. I think to provide these ways that we can have some real difficult conversations together. However, in addition to these challenging topics, I hope as we go through the slides, that you will also take a moment to enjoy Colescott's use of color, his complex and I would even say jazzy compositions, and even take delight in how he painted. In this exhibition, we begin with the painting 1919, and it's such a great beginning um, for this survey exhibition because it's uh, such a biographical painting. And one of my biggest takeaways in spending time with this survey is understanding Colescott's own history 
um, as critical to understanding the work itself. Um, so in this painting, we see Colescott's parents in this kind of bust profile, Colescott's father and mother. Behind them is um, a sort of uh, abridged map of the US. <clears throat> and it shows their migration from um, New Orleans, Louisiana, all the way to Oakland, California. And there's sort of motifs around the map um, the slogan of go west. Um, and in the middle is a tree with a, a, a family of robins um, that sort of represent Colescott's own family. Colescott had a, a brother, Warrington, um, Warrington, older brother Warrington Jr. And um, so the two bird chickies represent Robert and Warrington. It's really interesting too to see um, where the um, skin tone plays into the conversation. Robert Colescott's father is darker, Colescott's mother is lighter. And this is where there's a lot of tension of um, a family that is able to pass as white and encouraged to pass um, when, when it is opportune because you have more advantages. Um, the, the heartbreak and the tension within the family, um, the immediate family and extended family um, are all kind of laid out uh, based on the color of your skin. <clears throat> the other motif I'd like to point out is this kind of cloud imagery that kind of um, covers Colescott's mother and father, this sort of pink cloud um, on underneath the mother is the motifs of roses, a diary. Um, I don't know if that's a pen or a paintbrush and a, a slice of pie. The father side shows a bottle of alcohol, cigarettes, a music note, an open can. Um, and Cole Scott often talks about these things as studio sweepings that didn't pass art history. And this comp position and these, this idea of these sweepings kind of show up throughout his paintings. Um, so I hope you'll kind of uh, consider that as, as we look through his paintings today. I wanted to also share this painting, I mean, this photograph of Robert Colescott's parents, Lydia Kenner Hutton and Warrington Wickham Colescott Sr. <clears throat> this is around the time of their wedding. Colescott's father served in um, World War I um, as part of the Black Army unit. And um, so we see a photograph here and we can see how it serves as sort of an inspiration to Colescott's 1919 painting. <clears throat> So I'm gonna try and run you through Colescott's early career. Um, soon after graduating from high school in 1943, Colescott enlisted in the army and served in Europe. Um, in 1946, he enrolled in San Francisco State University and then UC Berkeley. Um, and these early works really sort of show what that education may have um, what he may have painted during that time in Berkeley. Um, I'm so taken um, by this painting on the left. Um, it really struck me when I first saw it in Cincinnati and um, I feel like it's resonating with me again um, because I can really see the complexity of Colescott's composition, um, the, the way that these sort of trapezoids and rectangular shapes bisect onto the plane at different levels the verticality of it. And that I think echoes in Colescott's compositions throughout his career. Um, what I also am drawn to in this painting is the pastel quality, the almost fleshy tones. And, and we see Colescott working through flesh and the, all the shades of that the flesh kind of presents um, throughout his painting. Um, in 1949, um, he goes to France on a GI Bill um, where he studied in the studio of the French modernist Fernand Legere. And with Legere um, really encourages him to kind of pursue more figurative work. 
that it's really um, in the figure. And so we see this on the left, a sort of direct sort of homage to Legere, and then um, this painting on the right that also um, still resonates his sort of complex um, composition of sort of this internal setting. Um, let's see. Um, Cole Scott then comes back to the States. Um, he takes a, a job in Seattle um, teaching at a high school and then soon thereafter moves to Portland um, to teach at Portland State College. And this is where his work shifts again. Um, the approach becomes more loose and gestural. Um, there is a, a de Kooning-esque kind of style. And Cole Scott is also kind of exploring why he's painting, what it is, what is the subject. Um, and he really does a lot of motifs, still lifes, landscapes, uh, nudes. It's hard to avoid the landscape when you're in the Pacific Northwest. But his time in Portland is also really important because it's also the start of his career. Um, his first gallery re representation is with Arlene Schnitzer, who had started up the Fountain Gallery in 1961. And in her inaugural group exhibition, Cole Scott was um, included from day one. And they had a really kind of great relationship. Um, it, you really get a sense that Arlene Schnitzer understood Cole Scott's work and really backed his work, even his most difficult and complex works. Um, she really understood the humor of it, the complexity of it and, and supported it fully throughout her life. Um, also kind of early on, we see kind of this beginning references to art history. Um, Cole Scott is certainly um, very much, um, uh, very much invested in art history. Um, but at this time, we also see his influence of Bay Area figurative painters um, like Elmer Bischoff, who was teaching briefly, um, uh, Cole Scott briefly at, at Berkeley. Um, and in these early figures, we begin to see Cole Scott kind of directly also taking from art history. Um, so here we see um, Olympia um, and Cole Scott is taking from Manet's Olympia. But in this case, the gaze is sort of reversed. Um, in Manet's painting, the nude figure looks directly at the viewer. Um, while the servant in the background is, is more hidden in the background and looks upon the courtesan. In this painting, um, it is the servant figure that is sort of looking um, at the viewer, uh, while the nude figure in the foreground is, um, her eyes are sort of cast down. And right um, soon after this painting, um, Robert Colescott applies for a position at the American Research Center in Cairo, Egypt. And he becomes the, um, the first uh, sort of artist in residence. Um, it was a pivotal moment for Colescott. Egypt was such a contrast to um, the Pacific Northwest climate. The cool, lush kind of climate was now replaced by this bright desert um, atmosphere. And it seemed to be the change that Cole Scott really needed. Um, Cole Scott's connection to the land became deeply rooted um, in his spirit. And it was here that he also seems to really have this um, greater acceptance and embrace of his identity um, as a black person. Um, these paintings were much more abstract. Um, representations of figures in space. In some ways, they were a return to his earlier stylistic interests, but he was also inspired by the eroded reliefs in the Valley of the Queens um, in ancient burial ground south of Cairo. Here we see figures fragmented, distorted, floating 
um, in a realm that is not actual space. Um, and it's built up through pure color. Of this experience, Colescott said, I was haunted by the spirit of the dead queens and felt that I could make out their images in the surrounding rocks and crevices. Um, upon his return, Colescott's work seems to take um, sort of another, another turn. Um, oh, before I, um, I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, he spent a little bit more time abroad. Um, he goes back again to Cairo, this time with his family. Um, but at the end of, of that year, um, the six day war between Israel and Egypt breaks out and Colescott and his family initially fled to uh, Rome and then to Paris. Um, and then he returns to the US in 1969. And I think this moment is so interesting because it was such a globally tumultuous time. Um, but while Colescott was abroad in the US, um, we were in the midst of the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam war movement. Um, but Colescott's paintings did not miss a beat of all that was sort of going on um, in the US. Um, and upon his return, Colescott's work seems to take another turn. It seems um, almost as if he's merging all of his experiences and his interests, his influence, um, his early interests in comic strips as a child, um, comic strips of the 1930s, the vibrant colors and floating compositions from Egypt, um, Bay Area figuration and West Coast funk, and the interplay of planes um, in his composition from very early on in his work. And using the strategy of revisiting um, prominent artists in history, uh, Pablo Picasso and Eugene Delacroix in his, um, and interpreting them in his own versions, Colescott renders his figures as black people thereby flipping the script of art history and pointing out what is largely ignored in art history. Um, humor in his painting um, compared to Jericho's desperation. So here we have um, Colescott's The Wreckage of the Medusa and I'll show you Theodore Jericho's version here. In this painting, the composition is all tight in the foreground, sort of rising to the top toward the sky. Um, and the figures that fall into the foreground, um, it's almost an impossible sort of scene of survival. Um, it's, it's one of desperation. Um, this figure on the, on the left with the sort of a red blanket over him, it looks like he's just flat out given up. Um, And in Colescott's, the composition is all kind of spread out, just like the studio sweepings, just like the detritus. Um, the boat, the ship that's sinking is way in the background. And it's about these kind of individual figures in the foreground. Um, Colescott here is depicted in the middle. You know, he's, he's holding up his bottle of alcohol. Um, you know, there's even sort of this baby Moses figure in a basket. Um, and um, amidst all this kind of desperation, here's this figure in the foreground happily swimming toward a, toward a lady while the fit, uh, sharks are swimming all around them. Um, critic Vivian Rayner notes of Colescott, um, she says, he knows that the ship of civilization is sinking, but he remains on board. This next painting is titled Eat Dem Taters and it's a spoof of Van Gogh's potato eaters. And again, we kind of see that, that similarity in Van Gogh's potato eaters. It's a very somber scene, um, even though it's a gathering at a table, um, it feels like there's very little movement. The light is dim. Um, the figure on the right who's pouring the coffee, um, it seems like she barely has the, the strength and energy. It's, it's kind of the, the last sort of bit of energy she's spending to kind of 
pour this coffee. Um, and then we go to Colescott's version. It feels lighter. Of course, the uh, folks here are smiling brightly, but it's also kind of, um, it's also unsettling. Um, here, you know, um, Larry Stokes Sims points out um, the myth of this idea of, quote, happy darkies. Um, it is the idea that Black people can be happy even with very little. Um, the retelling that gets um, occurred in Hollywood films, um, in school textbooks that describes Blacks as being fortunate to be enslaved um, toward more civilized um, circumstances. Um, and it is this biting use of satire um, that points us to these racist attitudes. Um, that's really um, difficult to talk about or to, um, or to even mention um, in normal conversation. And these are some of the works that are difficult for me to digest. Um, and two, it's my own struggle with the medium of satire being so sharp and effective in some ways and completely ambiguous in others. Um, satire is described as a playful distortion of reality. In definition, satire holds up human vices and follies to ridicule or scorn. Um, but because the satirical image message is ambiguous, it is up to the viewer to apply effort in completing the message. And where satire feels dangerous is when the message is received under one's already existing biases or favoring positions. Um, we have a lot of satire in our, in our contemporary culture right now. And I'm thinking here too about kind of the smoothness of Stephen Colbert's deadpan character um, on the Colbert Report. Um, you know, um, of course the liberals um, laugh, but also the conservatives um, feel that they are speaking to them. Um, or I think about Archie Bunker's character in All in the Family. Um, is he seen as a ridiculous character or, or one to kind of um, agree with? Um, and that's where I think it gets a little tricky and where then Colescott's own biography, his own identity um, plays a really important role in terms of um, how that satire is being and by whom um, that satire is being told. Um, in this painting, Colescott takes the idea of Shirley Temple's married name, which becomes Black, Shirley Temple Black. So then she, um, he flips this to Bill Robinson, um, Bill Robinson White, Bill Bojangles, as, as he was often called. Um, and this idea of what if, what if the race of the characters were flipped? What if America's sweetheart was Black and Bill Robinson's character was a supporting white helper? Um, the author Susan Goober suggests that as in so many of his other paintings, this picture converts characters traditionally portrayed as white into Blacks, switching the races so as to ridicule. First, our assumptions about white hegemony in cultural scripts, and second, the caricaturing that infects almost all depictions of African Americans in mass, in mass produced as well as elite art. I think what sits so uncomfortably for me personally in this painting is my own relationship to Shirley Temple and that childhood innocence. I loved Shirley Temple as a child, um, but I've held on to the character so much that I did not see the entire landscape, the fuller picture. Colescott points that out. Um, about satire, Colescott once said in an interview, I think satire is one is one way of talking about subject matter that's so serious that it's hard to get at, hard to get people to think about, that people are embarrassed about or afraid of. 
So with that in mind, I imagine many of us kind of share this sort of innocent um, memory of Shirley Temple. Um, but I wanted to pull up this scene. Uh, it's just a minute long of, um, of the scene that Colescott paints and to kind of take in the landscape, not so much um, Shirley Temple's ad adorable character. switch gears a little bit and focus on some of these um, paintings. Uh, Robert Colescott in the 80s was also working on this series called um, titled Knowledge of the Past is the Key to the Future. And with this Colescott is really looking at sort of these um, overlooked roles of African Americans um, or kind of these overlooked histories that um, where African Americans are deeply present. Um, in this case, um, he's um, kind of tri paying tribute to Matthew Henson, um, who actually led the way to the North Pole as part of Admiral Peary's expedition team. Um, the other painting is titled The Other Washingtons, and it looks at the legacy of miscegenation and unacknowledged ancestry. Um, there is a shift again in Colescott's work. Um, these later compositions are much more dense. The figures are all packed kind of near the foreground. And even the treatment of skin you can see becomes more modeled. Um, he also kind of shows these other figures where they're bisected, black and white. Um, and the modeling also is kind of echoed into the background and in the sky. In these works, the gesture of satire is no longer present, um, but the figure is still exaggerated, bumpy and lumpy uh, modeled textures that, um, um, that kind of show throughout. Um, this piece is titled School Days, and I think Colescott really is thinking about a lot of the systemic issues. Um, it's not of the Knowledge of the Past series, but it has a kind of a similar feel in, in terms of that model -y, um texture. Um, but by the time we get to these works, um, the message really is no longer through satire. Um, it really is speaking about larger histories and systemic issues. Um, in this painting, Colescott explains, the relationship about race are fragmented and institutional spaces like schools and housing projects are battlegrounds. But the gun that kills is ultimately pointed at you. So I want to end with this painting. Um, in the early 2000s, um, Cole Scott is faced with the effects of Parkinson's syndrome, but he continues painting to the very end. Um, and I think this last painting is so interesting. Um, it's um, Cole Scott usually did a lot of um, underpainting using this kind of 
bright pink color. And some argue that it's an unfinished painting. Um, but for this purpose, I, I feel like it's, um, it's not so much of an issue if the painting is finished or not. Um, to me, it shows Colescott's process, um, his composition, um, a really complicated layering, um, the white um, that also kind of bisects the, um, the, the composition of the painting, um, and the floating figures. All of the languages that he uses are in this painting. Um, even what I imagine are those studio sweepings that he kind of talks about. So I wanna end with um, a quote from Lowry Stokes Sims. She wrote a really great article um, for the Art Forum in 1984. And um, I found it really quite a powerful article. Um, but she says here, Cole Scott's paintings can be seen as a chronicle of his feelings which are inextricably caught up in his perceptions of himself as a black male and as an artist in America. It is the hypocrisy of the American ideal in particular that is his prey. And like the outlaws of Saturday afternoon Westerns, he raids the sacred cows of the high culture corral and subverts it through the artful transposition of icons. Great, thank you. So I will um, unshare, uh, stop share, okay. Um, thank you, Grace. Thank you. Um, and now we have time for questions from the audience. So remember, if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A box. Um, so I just wanted to start start off because some questions came to mind for me. Um, and I think they're the same questions that are always circling in my head when thinking about Cole Scott or when revisiting the work. Um, but I think, well, I'm trying to figure out which question I want to start with. I'll just start with this one first. <laughs> when you went to go see the show for the first time before we had gotten it here, um, I was just curious about what because I remember we had had some discussions about ways to tie in learning, right, and community into the work. Um, and I'm just curious, what are your thoughts about like the way the work's sitting and surprisingly and not surprisingly, especially right now with like the, what it can offer us for conversations, tough conversations that we're actually having at this moment in real time. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Jalisa. And I'm so glad you reminded me because we got to see, we got to go to Cincinnati together. And I, I'm so glad we, we were able to kind of um, think out loud together during that trip. Um, and um, what I think is so interesting with Cole Scott's work that it's never resolved within me. Um, never. <laughs> And, um, and especially in the time that we're in, I feel, um, I feel I'm always shifting. I think early on I was joking about how um, I'm, I'm having these sort of internal conversations or arguments with Cole Scott. And, um, and I think that is really kind of the gift that he, he brings us. Um, I almost wanted to share um, Richard a stand-up clip from Richard Pryor because um, Cole Scott notes how Richard Pryor is a is an influence and Richard Pryor's writer Paul Mooney, um, which is so amazing the the kind of satire that they're able to bring. Um, and when I was um, watching this one clip in particular that I thought to share, I found it so heartbreaking. Um, and to be able to kind of laugh through the most difficult moments um, offers us a space to, I think offers us a space to be able to talk about it that doesn't feel um, as embarrassing or that doesn't feel as shameful. Um, and I think maybe that's where Cole Scott's satire is really important and effective. Um, but, we are really in a time of um, 
reckoning I feel and um, and it's a great opportunity to have the work that gives us a platform to engage in conversation. Um, you know, I'm happy to say that, um, you know, my son's school uh, uh, embedded this kind of Black Lives Matter principles, you know, starting in his kindergarten. And we talk about these really difficult things and it's not, surely not resolved and they are conversations to have for a lifetime. But um, to be able to kind of begin the conversation um, at any point, I think is, is well worth it. Um, but it doesn't mean that I sit comfortably with Cole Scott. Um, you know, there is a there is a lot there, and I think the other thing is um, that I um, I haven't addressed at all in this talk too is um, Cole Scott was a, a male of a particular generation. Um, he was um, going to arts school when it was very male dominated, you know, and his art conversations, his art historical conversations um, are around the male gaze and the male artist. So um, there is that problem there too, um, that is also a lot to unpack. Yeah, and it seemed like something that um, was, I mean, like based off of the photo series with Carrie Mae Williams, like it's something that like he wasn't like, it, you know what I mean? Like there's an awareness there. And I think I'm just really interested in the um, opportunity to start the conversation, like the work start the conversation and there's no resolve. You know, there's, we're not given a, any like answers, which I don't know, to me is like a really amazing part of the work. Right, yeah. The um, So the Carrie Mae Weems was a triptych that was commissioned um, when Cole Scott, um, I totally didn't even mention this was, um, representing the U.S. for the Venice Biennale, the first um, African American artist, um, and the um, Carrie Mae Weems was con commissioned to kind of do the the photography for the publication. Um, and in this way, Carrie Mae Weems directed this uh, triptych, and it was about sort of um, this entrapment of modernism. Carrie Mae Weems inserts herself as a nude model, but she is also the author and the director of the of the photograph. Um, and Cole Scott is in kind of a, you know, in his painting clothes in the foreground, and um, one picture is him kind of holding his head. And yes, you're right. I think I think that is where I feel um, Cole Scott is much more engaging because he admits to kind of being in the muck of it, being consumed by it um, um, uh, um, and not being able to escape it, neither of them being able to escape sort of this trap of modernism. And um, I do appreciate that kind of, um, um, that kind of admission. Well, thank you. And we have a question from the audience, um, an audience member. Who are the artists that Cole Scott influenced? You know, I think so many um, artists, um, you know, certainly Carrie Mae Weems, um, uh, Carrie James Marshall, um, you know, Micheline Thomas. Um, there are a lot of African-American artists, certainly, um, you know, even looking at um, Kehinde Wiley's work, um, I think Cole Scott's work is so kind of American in that way. Um, it's it's almost like this question of you know um, also about Richard Pryor and you know his influences on that lineage of comedy. Um, that lineage is is really strong because he was. Um, the very kind of vocal African American artist. Um, I think different from Betty Sarr's work too. In that case, I think Betty Sarr, in some ways, was more pointedly political and and um, um, kind of paralleled in a different way. And we have another question from the audience. Um, I'm glad you brought up Richard Pryor as an influence for Mr. Colescott, as there's so much pain behind Pryor's satirical humor. 
I was fortunate to see the exhibition recently and was uncomfortably struck by what I thought was undertones of person pain in his satirical work. Has the artist spoken of this as part of his process? Um, you know, in, in interviews that I've read, I, um, in interviews that I've read, I haven't, I haven't heard that much or read about that much sort of vulnerability. Um, but I think what's come out in kind of family letters, um, there was obvious tension. Um, Warrington Colescott Jr., his older brother, um, was lighter skinned and was more favored by his mother. And that was a tension that really played out in the family. Um, and that, um, and both were um, prolific artists, um, really kind of um, amazing in their own ways. And where they kind of split is, I think, Colescott really kind of um, embraces um, embraces his identity more overtly um, and is also kind of willing to go to these uncomfortable places um, that Warrington did not go. Um, so it was not overt, certainly not in formal interviews, um, but it, it has been documented in, um, in personal communications with family. And then we have another question. Some of the color choices are reminiscent of Jacob Lawrence. Did Jacob Lawrence influence Robert Colescott? Oh, you know, I would imagine so, but I haven't read any, um, not that I've done a deep amount of research, but I haven't read um, any kind of direct connections. But um, yeah, you're right. When I think about kind of the, um, the black figures with the outlines, um, these uh, these kind of silhouettes that he brings up, there is certainly a connection with Jacob Lawrence, um, but I haven't, in my mind, I haven't recalled any, um, come across any of those conversations. Um, and just the last call, does anybody have any final questions for Grace? In the meantime, um, I do want to note as we're closing, the exhibition's up through the end of the year. Yes, it's um, up through December 13th, I think. I can't remember. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it's um, mid-December. Um, and yeah, December 13th. And then I also wanted to note for audience members as well that if you are interested in being able to engage more in discussion around Robert Colescott's work, we have some upcoming programs that offer an opportunity for more um, like intimate discussions, smaller group discussions around the work. Um, we have in November um, on the 12th, Thursday the 12th, we have an in dialogue session with Dr. Ethan Johnson, um, who runs the Black Studies Department at PSU. Um, and that discussion will be centered around this film called A Question of Color, which sort of looks at colorism within Black communities and then ties that back into the way it shows up in Robert Colescott's work. And then in November, we have both um, a lecture coming up on the uh, 6th. I believe I have that right, Grace, that date. Um, by Aaron Cristobal. Um, and then we have another in dialogue discussion, our final one on Thursday, December 10th, and that's with Broke Gravy. And that one will be more of a discussion around satire. Um, Broke Gravy is an improv comedy group um, based out of Portland, and they use improv to talk about some pretty, um, very real. Um, and oftentimes heavy topics in everyday life. And so that will be um, another opportunity to engage with satire in Robert Colescott's work. Uh, we got two more questions, I think, that came up before we wrap up, two more audience questions. Um, one is, was Colescott being restrained by the times that he was, that he was not more explicit? Um, 
I don't think so. I think Cole Scott really kind of, um, you know, I think, um, was he being, okay, I don't know if I got the full question, but um, I'll answer it in a couple different ways and, and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll have gotten it. But his work was really difficult to digest. And, and certainly I think there are not a lot of collectors um, who would choose to kind of put that kind of work in their homes. Um, so I think his works always sold for a little lower than, um, than his peers. Um, and I think Colescott understood that that was sort of one of the repercussions or one of the, um, uh, an understanding that it's kind of what had to be done. Um, but I think maybe it plays out a little bit politically um, teaching. Um, I think it was really difficult for him to hold a um, tenure position at U UC Berkeley. And maybe some of those uh, political things did come out because he was maybe more vocal and um, maybe a little bit more difficult in, um, in some ways. Um, but I think, but otherwise I don't really, um, I haven't encountered any moment where he shied away in his own work about what he needed to put out there. And then our final question, um, thank you for this virtual opportunity. Is it possible to see more of the exhibit online? I'm not going out during COVID. And that's a really good, really good question. <laughs> It's a great question. Um, you know, we have such a great, awesome team at the museum, including John Richardson and Becky Emmert, who are kind of in the background here, and um, Jalisa. I mean, we have this amazing um, online exhibition where um, all the text is up um, that is in the exhibition, all the images, um, uh, even install images. Um, so you can um, able you're able to see that. But in addition, um, Jalisa has worked with the in dialogue um, uh, speakers um, to kind of engage the works even deeper. And I highly encourage you to um, to listen to those in dialogues because it's really being able to deeply take in um, a couple of artworks through wonderful. Um, conversations. And um, I got so much out of those in dialogue um, comments. Um, and yeah, we'll continue to kind of have more um, as the in dialogue um, uh, series progresses. Um, and also um, with our keynote speaker, um, Aaron Cristoval, um, we have a lot of online presence. So I hope you'll be able to um, check that out. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just wanted to make a note that actually John um, just dropped into the chat for attendees a uh, link to go see the online exhibition of Robert Cole Scott. It's a really thorough, beautiful walkthrough with a lot of images. Uh, there's guiding text and videos. We have um, our facilitators, our dialogue facilitators also have videos up, commentary videos in there as well. And I did forget to mention that all of the programs coming up for Cole Scott are all virtual. So I forgot to say that. They are all virtual. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps up everything. Thank you so much, Grace. Fantastic. I really appreciate you all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Yes, thank you.